so hi everybody. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Asaf Tal, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Physics at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. During Dr. Tal's PhD, he focused on developing ultra-fast sequences for liquid state spectroscopy and imaging. During his time as a postdoctoral researcher at NYU Medical Center, he then transitioned to in vivo spectroscopy and has since worked on new acquisition and processing methods for studying mild traumatic brain injury and multiple sclerosis. His lab currently focuses on using functional spectroscopy to understand neurochemical changes in the brain when exposed to an external stimulus uh, and creating multi-parametric dictionary-based acquisitions for MRS. Uh, Dr. Tall mentioned to me that he's open to taking questions throughout the talk. Uh, so please write your question in the chat or just raise your hand with the little icon thing um, and I'll mediate it from there. Um, so with that, I'll let Dr. Tall start his talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation and setting up uh, everything. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, some of the work we do in the lab uh, uh, here in, at the Weizmann Institute. And uh, before I start, I always like to put acknowledgements up front. So the people who really do the, the work, uh, mostly I'll be talking about this method here that uh, we've been working on of multi-parametric uh, spectroscopy. And this is mostly the work of uh, uh, one PhD student, uh, Alex, and also our collaborator, Ivan Kiro from NYU. Uh, I will mention a little bit our work on functional spectroscopy, but it's really not going to be a focus of this talk and of course our funding sources. Okay, let me start by giving you our uh, calling card, uh, so to speak. Uh, we are a spectroscopy group. So basically uh, give us a region that is a few cubic centimeters uh, in the brain, give us a few minutes and we'll produce something that looks like this spectrum here, the center. Uh, in this particular case, this is what's called a proton spectrum because we're detecting signals from the nuclear magnetic moments in protons. And uh, naively speaking, each peak here uh, tells you something about the concentration of a different molecule or metabolite. For example, this large peak over here uh, comes from a CH3 group in a molecule we call n aspartate. We will meet it again, so don't worry if you don't remember the name. And sort of the big question that we focus on in the lab is trying to connect the things that we see here in the spectrum to, to some, in some way to cognition or to behavioral metrics and, and so on. So to do this, we've, we sort of have two chief avenues of research, one of which I'll be talking about today, which is a method we've been working on over the past several years that we call, we alternate between multi-parametric spectroscopy uh, and uh, spectroscopic uh, fingerprinting. And we also do work on functional spectroscopy where we look at changes to metabolite levels, usually glutamate and GABA, but also others during function, so we've done work on reinforcement learning, uh, motor activation, and so on. Uh, I'm happy to talk uh, to whoever is interested in this in the crowd at the end, but it's not going to be the focus of today's talk. Uh, rather, I'd like to talk about uh, this uh, method we've been uh, working on that I've already uh, mentioned, uh, that has been sort of the focus of uh, these three recent papers and a couple of more in the pipeline. Uh, and by, when I say multi-parametric spectroscopy, I mean a method that can simultaneously and efficiently measure not just the concentrations of metabolites as conventional spectroscopy does, but also the uh, relaxation times, which tell you something about the intracellular viscosity of both neurons and astrocytes. So I'll explain everything and I'll motivate it. And, and hopefully at the end of the talk, you'll agree with me. And I, my main goal is to convince you in the time I have uh, here today, is to convince you that there's what we feel is an exciting new way of doing MR spectroscopy that extends the conventional approach. And the way I'll, I'll do this is, first of all, I'll try to show you that it's worth doing, namely that uh, metabolite relaxation times, uh, T1 and T2, uh, are interesting biomarkers. And I'll provide both a mechanistic picture for this and also back this up with some hard data from the literature. Uh, I, I will argue uh, as a result that in some pathologies, it's actually metabolite relaxation times that this multi-parametric approach can give you that are the interesting quantity and not metabolite concentrations. Maybe this is not that surprising to some of you, but uh, those of you who, who do spectroscopy 
Uh, this would be something very counterintuitive because as spectroscopists, usually I feel like we're brought up to uh, assume that the added value of spectroscopy is in looking at biochemistry. And actually I'd like to push sort of a paradigm shift where it's actually relaxation times and not concentrations that are the interesting quantities. I'll talk about how we do this and how it can be done and show you that we can get high quality data from the same typical voxel sizes and acquisition times that you're used to. Uh, and that in some sense, it's a free lunch, uh, namely that you can add, get this additional information, T1 and T2, for all of the metabolites without almost paying any price in sensitivity in SNR per unit time. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in one of the slides. And then finally, I'll, at the end, I'll talk about the promise of the method. So some of the promise is going to be rooted in this hard data I'm going to show you, but I'll also show you some preliminary data that we've acquired from a cohort of cognitively impaired elderly patients. And if we have some time, I'll, I'll, I'll mention how we can use uh, this method to address some um, technical issues in uh, spectroscopy. We'll see if we, if we have time or we get to this at the end. Okay, so let me start by giving you a, a broad motivation and uh, overview of what it is that we're trying to do. And I'll start by doing, uh, I'll start doing this by sort of describing a quintessential MRI experiment or magnetic resonance experiment. So you have this, we have these nuclear spins attached to the protons in the molecules in our body. And when we put ourselves or, or the patient or volunteer in an MRI scanner in a strong magnetic field, we polarize these spins along the field. And then we can use a radio frequency resonant irradiation to excite these spins. So basically we tilt them away from the main magnetic field. And at this point they precess and they produce a signal that we can actually detect. Now, while this happens, uh, two processes occur that uh, return the system to its equilibrium state. First of all, the spins go out of phase with each other. And this is a process that's called decoherence. It occurs with a time scale of T2, or from the order, order of 100 milliseconds in vivo. And this leads to signal decay. And in addition, there's a thermal uh, relaxation, uh, return to the Boltzmann uh, distribution, which happens with a time scale of about a second. And this time scale is called T1. Now, over the past several decades, it's been uh, fairly well known that T1 and T2 relaxation times of the nuclear spins in water, so in the H's and the H2O's, are the main sources of information and contrast in conventional MRI-based radiology. And you don't need you know, a lot of uh, convincing to do it just by showing you T1-weighted images, these two images here, and a T2-weighted image, this image over here, you can immediately see the added value of uh, looking at uh, the relaxation times of water. So just as an example, here on the right, you see that the, this lesion in the brain of a patient with multiple sclerosis, and the reason you can see it is because its T2 relaxation time is different compared to the surrounding tissue. Now, wh why is that? What is it exactly that these relaxation times measure? What are they sensitive to? Uh, so <clears throat> it, it turns out that they're sensitive to the uh, thermal rotational motion of, of the molecules. So imagine this water molecule over here and imagine that it's rotating over time. And think of that it has these uh, two protons with these attached nuclear spins. Let's say just for simplicity that they both point in the same direction. Now you can imagine the field lines that spin number one exerts on spin number two. With the molecules in, in, in the initial position, it's anti-parallel, but just by rotating the molecule by 90 degrees, it becomes parallel. So, the sort of take home message from this is that as the molecule rotates, the nuclear spins due to this uh, dipolar interaction uh, uh, feel this time varying field that looks almost random. And it is this stochastic resonant and non-resonant interactions that lead to these uh, two time scales, T1 and T2. I'm not going to go any deeper into the physics, uh, but this should give you sort of a, a general intuition as to what these numbers mean, what they tell you. And radiology really tries to uh, work its way back, back from relaxation times to the underlying tissue. So basically what I've shown is that when you change the viscosity of the medium or the ability of water molecules to rotate, you change the nature of the local B, B uh, magnetic field fluctuations and this changes the relaxation times of water. 
And by measuring changes to the relaxation times, you're actually measuring changes to the microenvironment in which water resides. So I say viscosity here, I mean it in a general sense, uh, uh, you know, probably a biophysicist would argue with me, but uh, I, I, will, I will put it as it is. You know. uh, <clears throat> now, when you think about it, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, the added value of it is that it detects the signals from protons in non-water molecules. So I've shown you this spectrum already where this large peak over here, for example, comes from this CH3 group, from the protons in this CH3 group in this molecule, which you call acetyl aspartate or just NAA for short. And the interesting thing about the NAA is that it has specificity, cellular specificity. It is mainly found in one particular cell type in the central nervous system, which is neurons. So uh, unlike water, uh, uh, NAA is specific to a particular cell type. And this also makes its T1 and T2 relaxation times specific to a specific cell type, neurons in this case. And many other uh, metabolites here have specific cells or subcellular compartments that are associated with them. So to give you a sort of a picture you can imagine, uh, imagine that you're looking at this neuron and you're zooming in and you have this NA molecule that's uh, tumbling about, rotating, and it's surrounding, surrounded by proteins and macromolecules that uh, you know, constitute the microenvironment. And basically these determine the local viscosity and how easily this NA molecule can rotate. And they basically determine what the relaxation times of NAA T1 and T2 would be. So by measuring these relaxation times, you're actually getting a marker for the intraneuronal viscosity in a generalized sense. Now, we've had this idea of uh, trying to measure these relaxation times for a while. And, and recently we've, uh, when we went about and tried to ask ourselves a more quantitative uh, question of really what would be the added value of measuring the metabolite relaxation times. And to answer this, which we've done in this uh, sort of review and analysis paper in MRM, we've looked at really pretty much every reference we could find at either one and a half and three Tesla, uh, listing changes to metabolite relaxation times uh, in you know, a wide range of pathologies and regions of interest. And the way we try to assess the added value of measuring metabolite relaxation times in addition to metabolite concentrations is by looking at something called the receiver operating characteristic curves. <clears throat> Sorry, curves. So just to give you an example, uh, think about normal appearing white matter in multiple sclerosis, where it is well known that there's underlying pathology despite the fact that uh, this normal appearing white matter looks normal on, on many water T1 and T2 weighted scans. Uh, so what spectroscopy can show you by looking at this neuronal marker NAA is that the concentrations of NAA change, they actually decline in multiple sclerosis. So you can imagine having a distribution of NAA values for patients and another distribution for controls. Uh, and you can, you know, maybe by measuring NAA, you can tell apart controls from patients. And you can quantify how well these two distributions are far apart by first of all, constructing something known as a receiver operating characteristic curve which were right by you calculate the uh, fraction of true positives versus the fraction of uh, false positives. And then you can measure the area underneath this curve. If you've never seen this, don't worry about it. The only thing you need to remember is that you can measure the area underneath this uh, magical curve. And this will tell you how far apart these uh, uh, distributions are. So this will be a number between uh, half and one where half means that your you know, your two distributions are on top of the other and you have a useless biomarker. And one means that they're completely apart and you have a perfect biomarker. So in this case, we just looked at one of the literature references here. I'm showing you some data from it and, and uh, the area under the curve could be like 0.64. Then we asked what, how much uh, better can we be by adding T1 and T2 of NAA to this uh, calculation. And, and we describe in this paper a way of constructing a, a, an optimal multi-parametric classifier that takes into account these three quantities. And what this does is it really creates distributions that become farther apart. And this also increases the area underneath, uh, underneath the receiver operating characteristic curve, sometimes considerably. So 
what we've done is we've taken all of these references and we've calculated the area under the curves for just using concentrations. And this would re represent the case of using conventional spectroscopy uh, versus using or adding to that the T1 and T2 relaxation times of the metabolite in these uh, references. And this would constitute this, this multi-parametric approach. And never mind now that I haven't explained yet how, how we can do this. Just let's look at whether this is worth doing. So when you average over all of these references, uh, the average area under the curves goes up from 0.72 to 0.85. And you know, obviously this includes many cases where this wouldn't make any sense just because relaxation times are not good uh, markers. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> if you confine yourselves to the top 10 cases where you see the largest improvement, then this becomes much more pronounced uh, going from an uh, average area under the curve of 0.68 to 0.92, which is a very considerable improvement. Remember, this goes from 0.5 to, to 1. Uh, in these cases, these most significant cases include uh, things like uh, normal appearing white matter, uh, uh, NAA in normal appearing white matter in multiple sclerosis, uh, creatine in Alzheimer's disease in the posterior cingulate uh, gyrus, and choline in, uh, in ALS in the motor cortex. So, these results uh, strongly motivate, in our opinion, the pursuit of these multi-parametric sequences that would give us a, a very measurable and concrete uh, improvement. So I hope that I've given you a sort of both mechanistic and sort of hard number motivation for building, you know, for trying to simultaneously acquire uh, metabolite relaxation times and concentrations. The sort of the conventional problem with this is that both measuring concentration times, that is doing relaxometry, and doing spectroscopy are perceived as you know, being complex and time consuming. So really people don't do this on a routine basis. Even if you see this in, in research papers, it's usually these prolonged acquisitions that use uh, inversion recovery experiments or multi-echo experiments with many, many time points. And you could say that the thing, the, this multi-parametric approach that I'll talk about in, in a couple of slides, is really our solution to the problem whereby using variable excitations and, and dictionary matching, we show that we can in fact measure these relaxation times in addition to concentrations within the same clinical scan times, the same voxel sizes, and without almost paying a price to sensitivity. Now, before describing how this is done, I'd like to share with you uh, some reproducibility data uh, that uh, we've uh, described in uh, these two papers. Mostly I'll be talking about this uh, 2019 NMR and biomedicine paper. Uh, so I'm going to uh, quote numbers that uh, we got from scanning uh, uh, 14 healthy volunteers with a four and a half uh, CC voxel placed in parietal uh, white matter. Uh, and the, the data I'm going to show you has come from this multi-parametric black box acquisition in a total of five uh, minutes of acquisition. But this is a, a true reproducibility study in the sense that we've scanned patients, uh, sorry, scanned healthy volunteers, took them out completely from the scanner, put them back in and re-scanned them. So I'm going to show you a true intra-subject coefficients of variation. So what does this give you? So first of all, this acquisition gives you concentrations and relaxation times T1 and T2 for all visible metabolites in the spectrum. Let me give you some uh, concrete numbers for some metabolites that are you know, well used in the, or, or, or measured in the literature. Uh, uh, the first is n aspartate, which is kind of considered the easiest metabolite uh, to quantify. I'm talking about the singlet at uh, 2 ppm, uh, if that, uh, you know, just to be a little bit more concrete. So the intra-subject coefficient of variation defined as the uh, standard deviation divided by the, by the mean uh, is 3.2%, which is in line with what you'd expect from conventional spectroscopy. And in addition, you get 4% and 3% for the T1 of NAA and T2 of NAA. Uh, another example, uh, myonositol, which is a, an osmolite that is found primarily in, in astrocytes. Uh, it is a little bit more challenging to quantify uh, because it's what's called a J-coupled metabolite. And the uh, coefficient of variation that we get for its concentrations are 6.4%. Again, this is in line with what you get from a similar acquisition using conventional methods. And you get CVs of uh, five and a half and 6.1% for T1 and T2 of myonositol. And then finally, this five minute black box, uh, black box acquisition also gives you uh, water reference uh, data. 
which you use for absolute quantification. So you get the signal of water. And in addition, you get something that conventional spectroscopy doesn't really give you, which is the T1 and T2 relaxation times of water in the voxel. And you get uh, an estimate, a high quality estimate of the transmitter and homogeneity B1 plus within the voxel, which is again important for absolute quantification. So hopefully these numbers have given you some idea of how robust or reproducible this approach is. Now I'd like to talk about uh, how we do things. Uh, and this is a combination of, of two, two uh, approaches that have really become popularized in the field of magnetic resonance over the past uh, decade, which is a variable excitation and model-based reconstruction. Uh, and there have been multiple publications on this. Probably the most famous one is this uh, Nature paper on this technique, uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting from the lab of uh, Griswold by Danma. Uh, this has been published in 2013, but these ideas have been around uh, before that. Uh, you know, model-based reconstruction has been suggested in the context of compressed sensing. Uh, variable excitations have been uh, uh, suggested in the context of uh, T2 mapping uh, based on these echo modulation curves and, and so on. Uh, so these ideas have been around for a while and we wanted to see how well they would fare uh, when applied to the sort of complex problem of spectroscopy. So the first thing you need for these model-based reconstruction is a model. And, and the model really is, is a, a way of uh, calculating what the uh, response of your spin system would be to an extern external uh, magnetic field that you as an experimentalist can vary. So in, we actually have a good way or we have a good model or a good way of modeling the uh, response of nuclear spins to an external magnetic field. Uh, for uncoupled spins like water and the singlets we see in the, in the MRS spectrum, we have the Bloch equations. And for coupled spins, we have a more complex quantum mechanical uh, uh, description, which uses something called the, the Liouville equation, which we actually have a pretty good understanding of how to write down and how to solve. And we also have ways of adding relaxation ad hoc to this description, which uh, actually does not include a relaxation in its basic format. So I'm not going to go into the details of how these, uh, how we add relaxation and more about these models. Uh, you're welcome to ask me if, if you want to either during the talk or once I'm done, but suffice to say, uh, we do have a good way of modeling the temporal evolution of these nuclear spins. This M here, which gives us our signal in response to the field B that we apply. And as a function of the parameters that we're interested in quantifying, namely T2 and T1. So how is this uh, done? Uh, basically, we take a sequence, a single voxel a spectroscopy sequence. And, and here I'm showing a, a famous sequence called PRESS, uh, point resolved spectroscopy. And this sequence is used to localize the uh, signal to a single voxel, like the one you see here uh, on the right. Now, what we do is we vary the parameters of the sequence with each excitation. In this particular example, we vary the flip angle, or the power of the first pulse, we value and we val vary uh, the echo time, the delay between the pulse and the acquisition, and the repetition time, which is the delay between successive uh, uh, excitations. And you can see here in the center, the way in which we vary these parameters, FA, TR, and TE, with each excitation. And we call this a schedule. So I'm showing you here a 10-step schedule, where I'm giving you a prescription of how to vary F, A, T, R, and T, in each of 10 successive excitations. Uh, this entire thing, going through this entire thing, takes us about half a minute. And when we're done, we just repeat. So we average for better SNR until we hit the five minute mark. Uh, this is what uh, data looks like from this uh, uh, acquisition. <clears throat> this is data from an HCC voxel from the posterior singlet cortex from a healthy volunteer. So you can see that each of these excitations uh, gives us a separate spectrum. And what we can do is we can select one of these peaks and follow its magnitude or the way it changes over time uh, as we, you know, throughout the schedule. For example, this large peak over here, if you recall or remember, it belongs to the CH3 group in this molecule NAA. So we can highlight it and follow how it changes over time. And what this does, it gives us a fingerprint, basically gives us you know, a way in which this changes over time. And this encodes uh, the relaxation times T1 and T2 of NAA, uh, namely because uh, NAA 
it tries to return to thermal equilibrium with uh, time constants T1 and T2, and we try to perturb it or prevent it from returning to equilibrium. Uh, this temporal evolution tells us something about the T1 and T2 of NAA. What we can do is we can take this experimental fingerprint and we can start running simulation using our model until we, uh, and we can vary the parameters of the model T1 and T2 until we hit a specific set of parameters that matches our experimental data. And then we say, aha, these parameters in our simulation are, are what describes our experimental system. So we have a way by fitting to a simulation of estimating T1 and T2 for NAA. Uh, and then we can also use bootstrapping to uh, using the thermal noise in the measurement to estimate the errors in the, in the measurement. Now, what I've shown you here, uh, I've mentioned NAA, but you can do this for any of the metabolites in the spectrum. And you can extract this way the relaxation times for each of the metabolites that you see in, in your MRS spectrum over here. Finally, the last step of this methodology is you take all of these spectra, you sum them up, you fit them using one of the uh, many existing packages for spectral processing. And then you use this to estimate the concentrations of each metabolite. One thing that we can do that conventional spectroscopy can't is because we have the relaxation times for both water and the metabolites, for each of the metabolites in the spectrum, we can actually correct the effects of relaxation uh, on our measured uh, values and uh, actually get accurate estimations of the uh, true physiological concentrations of each uh, metabolite, something again that conventional uh, spectroscopy can't really do. It has to assume uh, T1 and T2 values based on the literature which may or may not be you know, correct or may vary from between subjects. Uh, I promised you a free lunch at the beginning of this talk. And uh, this is a, 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 a somewhat uh, technical explanation. So I'm, I'm going to sort of try to tell you what it is I'm trying to say. And then I'll uh, briefly go through the explanation. Don't worry if you, if you don't follow it. It's, it's not that uh, terrible, but I do like to give a quantitative uh, meaning to my statements. So basically, I mean that this multi-parametric approach has a similar SNR per unit time compared to conventional spectroscopy. So in a conventional acquisition, uh, what you do, what you, what you would do, and let's look at a typical metabolite that has a T1 of say 1.2 seconds and a T2 of 200 milliseconds. And, and this is really, you can do this. Uh, it doesn't really change if you, if you change these values within in vivo bounds. What you would sometimes do is you would say, well, I want to maximize my SNR per unit time. And then what you would do is you would excite your spins repetitively on average, and you would time your excitations about 1.2 times T1 apart, which is about one and a half seconds. And this would give you optimal SNR per unit time. Now, this is good because you want optimal SNR per unit time, but it's also bad because what happens is that your spectrum becomes T1 weighted. The concentrations that you measure become dependent on T1 and that introduces some bias into your conventional spectroscopic uh, concentration and estimations. Now, one way to avoid this is to space the excitations far apart about uh, four times T1 or five times T1, say five seconds apart. So this is subpar in terms of SNR per unit time. And if you do the calculation, you get about 0.78% of the, of the optimal case but it has no T1 weighting. So your estimates of the concentrations are more accurate. And if you compare the sensitivity that we get from our multi-parametric approach, it's kind of almost the same as you would get from this unweighted conventional spectroscopic approach, just a little bit lower. And the reason this happens is because the sort of mean time between successive excitations in this multi-parametric approach is on the order of T1 or 1.2 T1, uh, much like this optimal case over here. So this has been my sort of uh, short uh, explanation of the free lunch uh, uh, promise, but uh, you can just uh, recall that uh, both approaches have similar SNR per unit time. And another thing that I don't really uh, have time or really don't want to go too deeply into, but I do want to mention is that we have looked into the question of designing optimal schedules, namely schedules that minimize the estimation error per unit time in the metabolite T1 and T2s. And we've asked ourselves, how really should we vary TR, TE, and FA? So how should we design these schedules to minimize the estimation errors? 
And we've used uh, in this uh, 2019 NMR biomedicine paper uh, uh, genetic algorithms to look at many different schedule lengths uh, ranging from five to 100. And an interesting uh, thing that we found uh, is that the performance per unit time actually does not depend on the schedule length, just on the total acquisition time. So basically all schedules have, uh, when they're optimal, have the same uh, um, sensitivity or accuracy uh, per unit time. So it's kind of an interesting finding. And you can go to this paper where you have explicit recipes of how to vary TR, TE, and, and the flip angle uh, to get an optimal schedule. Now, I didn't really talk about many small things, and uh, I'm sure many of you know that the devil is in the details. For example, I didn't talk exactly how we extract the fingerprinting. Uh, you know, we can do this by fitting or by looking at peak amplitudes. I didn't really go into detail about how we simulate the dictionary and we use neural networks that simulate the full 3D voxel profiles. Uh, I didn't talk about how we model relaxation and couple spins or how we take into account different fitting challenges at different echo times. So all of these are very important. Uh, I think they're a little bit too involved for a general audience uh, such as yourselves. But again, you're free, free to ask me in the questions or just email me after the talk. I'll be happy to discuss and, and describe and, and share uh, how we approach uh, many of these things. Okay, in the time I have uh, remaining, I want to talk about promises. And, and, and I've, I think I've already, in a sense, uh, talked about them in the beginning when I motivated the, the method. And, and I motivated it not just by giving a mechanistic picture, but also by showing you, you know, people have measured T1 and T2s of different metabolites and different pathologies, you know, using prolonged lengthy acquisitions. And they have seen considerable changes in some cases. So I think that's one big promise of doing these multi-parametric approaches. Uh, but I also want to share some data that we've started acquiring uh, from a cohort of uh, mild cognitively impaired uh, elderly patients uh, and why we think this uh, method could be an interesting contribution to the way people look at dementias. And I think this might, you know, hopefully also bring together some, some of the concepts I've been talking about uh, in the previous slides. And to, to give this context, I have to talk a little bit about dementias and, and how conventionally they're looked at uh, using imaging today. So the sort of the hallmark of imaging, of imaging dementias and Alzheimer's disease in particular has focused on looking at three sort of core aspects of the, of the disease where people have looked at the accumulation of amyloid beta plaques uh, in the intra, sorry, in the uh, outside of neurons. And this is done using positron emission tomography. There are tracers for doing this. Uh, they're very expensive and difficult to acquire, uh, but they are there. Uh, people also look at the accumulation of uh, tau neurofibrillary tangles inside of neurons. And again, there are PET tracers for doing this. Uh, over, just over the last couple of years, we, we saw these second generation PET tracers that uh, are, have become very specific to tau pathology uh, in vivo. Again, they're very expensive and difficult to, to synthesize and administer, but they are there. Uh, and then finally, what people look at is uh, neurodegeneration and they almost always look at the late stages of neuro neurodegeneration by looking at structural MRI. Uh, which looks at uh, volume atrophy. And this volume atrophy happens just because, you know, cells die, neurons uh, atrophy and, and uh, die off. And you can very clearly see this, uh, you know, this is just a, a slice from a brain, a post-mortem brain of an Alzheimer's uh, patient compared to a healthy brain. You, can, you know, you don't, you don't need to be an expert to see that uh, this thing here on the right is significantly different than this uh, healthy brain here on the left. And this is reflected in structural uh, T1 and T2 weighted MRI images. Now, the way we think a, a multi-parametric MRS marker could add to this conventional framework for looking at the uh, dementias and Alzheimer's disease is by looking at two processes that the conventional framework work does not look at. And the first one of these uh, has to do with the early stages of neurodegeneration. So long before you have neuronal loss, there are many, many degenerative uh, processes happening in, inside neurons, uh, in, which include you know, uh, large changes to the intraneuronal uh, space and microenvironment, which would lead to some 
changes, uh, hypothesized changes to the uh, intraneuronal viscosity. And in addition, uh, there is also a large component of neuroinflammation that is uh, well acknowledged, but for which there is really no very good marker uh, for, uh, for actually measuring this effect. Uh, one of the things that, for example, uh, inflammation leads to is uh, this astrocytic hypertrophy where these astrocytes uh, due to inflammation actually uh, expand in, in volume and change their morphology. Now, uh, we argue that, or we hypothesize, and I'll, I'll show you some data to, to support this in a moment, uh, that this change in, or this increase in the intraneuronal viscosity would lead to a decrease in the relaxation times of NAA, which is a neuronal marker, while this uh, uh, hypertrophy of astrocytes would lead to a reduction in uh, the intraastrocytic viscosity, which would in turn lead to an increase in the T1, T2 relaxation times of myonositol. So this is a little bit like edema. You know, if you've looked at ever at a T2 uh, uh, images of water of in edema, you immediately see this increase in T2 values for water. So we hypothesize some, 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 something similar for myonositol, which is found primarily inside of astrocytes. So the data I'm going to show you comes from a, from a, 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 a small cohort uh, of eight uh, MCI patients and nine uh, agent sex match controls. We started doing this about a year and a half ago and needless to say, uh, COVID uh, sort of put a, 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 you know, dampened a lot of our uh, efforts. Uh, we hope to be, go back, get back to scanning now that we have the uh, vaccines on the way. Uh, in, in this cohort here, I'm showing you their clinical assessment scores. And so this is a, a, a score that's called the, well, I guess you guys are uh, more familiar with this even than I am, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Score, uh, given your location. But basically this is a clinical assessment score that goes between zero and 30. Uh, anything above 27 is considered normal. Anything below is considered impaired. And you can see the distribution of uh, the cognitively normal in, in, in uh, blue, everything is above 27. And the eight MCI subjects uh, hover around 20. Uh, uh, and you can see the, their individual uh, data here. Now we've measured multi-parametric data from the posterior cingulate cortex from an 8cc voxel and the hippocampus from a 3.7cc voxel. And uh, I'll walk you through the results. First of all, uh, from the uh, uh, from NAA, uh, what we've seen are three things. Uh, first of all, we've seen a decline in the concentrations of NAA, both in the hippocampus and in the posterior cingulate cortex. So the, these box plots show the data from the cognitively normal in, in blue and the MCI patients in red. And this is not new. Uh, the fact that NAA concentrations uh, go down in the PCC and the hippocampus is well known. There have been a lot of work by a, uh, you know, prominent groups like from Kantarchi that has shown this, but still it's a good, uh, it's a good thing that we reproduce these studies and it's a good sanity check for us. Uh, for us. The new finding uh, that we've seen is that there is a statistically significant reduction in, uh, in the T1 relaxation time of NAA. And not only that, but that this reduction is actually well correlated to the reduction in the cognitive MOCA scores of the, of the subjects. So this again is for us a very good sanity check that the changes that we're measuring are not just some sort of random effects, but something that is actually related to the cognitive decline uh, uh, and the dementia itself. The second result I'd like to share with you is that uh, it has to do with myonositol. And what we've seen is an increase in the concentrations of myonositol in the posterior cingulate cortex. And this is again, something that has been reported uh, by previous groups, sorry, it's, it's over here. And, but another thing that we've seen uh, is, an, you know, is an increase in the T2 relaxation time of myonositol. It's almost statistically significant. And you know, we hypothesize that uh, when we increase the sample size, it's going to uh, actually become significant. Uh, and, and this is in line with this hypothesis of astrocytic hypertrophy that I've laid out in the previous slide. So together, I think this gives us some uh, uh, some, uh, um, I think, excitement on our side that this multi-parametric uh, marker could actually tell us some interesting things about processes that the conventional uh, imaging approaches do not really take into account. 
Finally, I won't uh, go into details uh, because I don't want to go over time, uh, but I did want to mention just briefly that uh, this idea of multi-parametric spectroscopy, that the variable excitations that we use can also be used to tackle some uh, uh, open problems in technical problems in spectroscopy. And just one such example I'm, uh, I'm showing in this slide here, that has to do with lipid suppression. So when you do spectroscopic imaging, when you go beyond a single voxel, uh, what happens is that you often get unwanted lipid signals uh, inside, in voxel inside the brain. And this happens because of the point spread function of your imaging. Basically the lipid signals bleed from the, uh, around the brain in, into, into voxel inside the brain and, and you get this uh, contamination. Now, it turns out that when you look at the time evolution of metabolites under variable excitations and compare it to the time evolution of lipids, they look very different. And the reason they look different is that the T1 and T2 relaxation times of metabolites are similar to each other, but are very different from the relaxation times of lipids. And what I'm showing you here on the right is a, just, this is just a simulation at this point. It's a simulation of a phantom that has lipids here in the periphery and three compartments with NAA, creatine, and choline. And I'm showing you a spectrum here at the bottom taken from a voxel inside this uh, NAA compartment. So you would imagine that you'd only get, a, a, you would expect that you'd only get a, an NAA signal, but in fact, you get this lipid signal in, in addition because of this bleeding effect from the periphery. So it's not really there, but you see it. It's obviously an artifact. Now, what you can do is you can take your signal and you can project it into a subspace in your dictionary that is comprised only of the metabolite signals. And what this does effectively is filter out the lipid contribution from your uh, signal and lets you uh, focus only on the metabolite signals uh, in your image. So at this point, I'll, I'll just uh, put this out as a, as a promise. Uh, and uh, you know, there are many, many other interesting things that you can do with these variable excitations. Uh, that, and I'll, again, I'll happy to talk about them if anyone is uh, interested. Uh, I'll actually skip this because uh, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in uh, details. And, and, and with that, I'll, just, I'll, I'll finish and, and summarize uh, sort of the talk. I've, I've basically just put back or recapitulated all of the points I've shown you in the beginning. And I've hopefully managed to convince you that this multi-parametric approach is worth doing. Uh, that metabolite relaxation times are interesting biomarkers, that it can be done, that you can get high quality data from the same voxels that you're used to, so you don't have to pay a price, uh, uh, that it's a free lunch, you get the same sense, pretty much almost the same sensitivity per unit time. Uh, I, I really do hope that uh, uh, you would consider that looking at metabolite relaxation times could sometimes be more rewarding or more interesting than looking at metabolite concentrations. And finally, I hope that uh, our preliminary data has convinced you that, or at least excited you, that uh, this multi-parametric approach could offer us some new insights uh, into dementias and imaging and Alzheimer's disease, and perhaps also tackling uh, existing problems in MRS methodology. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, conclude and be happy to take any questions if there are any. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to speak up, uh, raise your hand or write things in the chat and I can relay the questions. I have a question. Um, so, I mean, wonderful talk, really innovative and thought provoking stuff. Can you, uh, from the perspective of someone who'd be more of a, from the perspective of someone, perspective of me, who'd probably want to use this type of technology, more from a user's perspective or as a power user. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the role of field strength um, and, and how that would play into this? And also, you know, what would the possibilities of be of, I, I can see this kind of technology being really useful in pharmacological challenges or, or some sort of treatment study. Um, you know, so we work a lot with animal models in, in the lab. Do you have any thoughts on how this could be translated that way? Uh, so, so I have a, my answer is, has two parts. First of all, in terms of field strength, like many other, uh, um, uh, like like for water, where you get better contrast with T1 and T2 as you go to higher field strengths, 
we would expect a similar behavior for metabolites. For both water and metabolites, the sources of uh, relaxation or the mechanism is the same. It's dipolar interactions, and these uh, lead to better, or hypothesize at least, to lead to better contrast or better changes between, say, healthy and, and pathological tissue as you go to higher field strengths. Uh, from a methodological point of view, uh, I, I would say that uh, this sort of approach can also solve issues at higher field strengths. For example, uh, I, I don't know how much of an issue it, it is in mice, uh, but in humans, when you go to say, say seven Tesla or 9.4 Teslas, you start getting these uh, radio frequency homogeneities. So this multi-parametric approach where you actually model the evolution of your system uh, actually builds this into the, into the model and lets you estimate these uh, inhomogeneities and then fix them. So you do everything by from, you know, you estimate everything from the variable excitation uh, schedule that you apply. So it's actually, I'd say even more suited uh, to higher fields than it is to lower fields, although it is perfectly valid at, at three Tesla and one and a half Tesla as well. Uh, I, uh, we're actually I've been thinking of, uh, of translating this uh, to our broker uh, preclinical scanner over on our side. Uh, so if this happens, uh, I'll be happy to share. Uh, Please, please, please keep this in mind when you do it. That'd be great. <laughs> sure. All right, Jamie, go for it. Uh, great talk, Asaf. That was really, really nice work. Um, Thank you. I have a question. You said you're using a dictionary to figure out the T1, T2 for the metabolites, but um, when it comes to actually the concentration, it was less clear. So I guess you have to have some kind of reference. Yes. And what are you using for your reference? And then, and then how do you then take your kind of um, your acquisition that has many different kind of types, your, your metabolite acquisition, and then relate that back to your reference? Okay. So uh, the concentrations, it's true that the dictionary fitting only, uh, only yields T1 and T2. Uh, we do have a reference and our reference is water. And the quantification process uh, or concentrations uh, happens after we estimate the relaxation times for each metabolite. So we mm -hmm. sum all of our different excitations uh, and we get one, you know, a single spectrum which we can fit and we can take the uh, fitted signal of NAA say from here, which uh, is obviously T1 and T2 weighted, heavily weighted even, but we can, first of all, correct it because we know exactly how to model this T1 and T2 weighting and we have the T1 and T2 relaxation times for NAA. And we can divide it by the water signal for which we also have T1 and T2 so we can correct the relaxation effects for water. So we get a, a so we extract the concentrations from the sum spectrum and we use our knowledge of both the model and the relaxation times to correct for all of the, you know, unwanted effects. Great. That's really good. Um, can I ask a second part of my question? It's kind of a separate question, but uh, sure. the question was about, it, um, do the metabolite relaxations track well with water relaxation? So if I'm, if I'm in a pathology where, um, say, I have a reduced NAA T1 or something, does that sometimes also mean that water T1 and all of the metabolite T1s are going to kind of move in the same direction because of the viscosity affecting them all the same way? Uh, so in reality, I don't know. I don't know because people don't really track both of these things together and even less so in, uh, in pathology. So either people, you know, either imaging people do water T1 and T2 or spectroscopy people do metabolite T1 and T2. And what you really want to do is correlate them hopefully even intra-subject. Uh, so the real honest answer is I don't know. Uh, now, I would say that uh, it will depend, I think, on the mechanism that would modulate the water T1 and T2. For example, you could imagine that uh, for some reason, uh, the, the, because you have extracellular water, there's something that's happening, you know, there's some breakdown that crowds the extracellular water and leads to water T1 and T2 changes. 
but not necessarily to intraneuronal changes. So perhaps the T1 and T2 of NAA would not change. But to say, you know, this is, this is a hypothesis, uh, who, who knows? You actually have to go and, and measure, or take, take a bunch of MS patients or something and, and look at it. So I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, uh, I think that, that's as good as I can do, uh, probably. But uh, yeah, I mean, with your technique, you could, you, could you could test that and you could check, which would be really cool. That's right. Actually, uh, we can uh, we can go back and look at the at the MCI patient data, uh, which is actually a good idea now that you mention it, and, and look at what we've uh, gotten. We're also trying to collect uh, well, well, we've been collecting MS data uh, uh, over at NYU over the past uh, year and a half. Again, that's been not been going too quickly uh, for obvious reasons. But uh, once we're done with that, we'll almost surely look at the correlations as well. Great, thanks very much. Uh, I, I saw that uh, there's a question from the chat uh, mm -hmm. about whether this multi-parametric MRS uh, technique could be extended uh, to spectroscopic imaging. Uh, and, and the answer is yes, uh, with some caveats. So the caveats are that uh, basically, if you just think about multi-parametric acquisitions, then they're basically a, an extra dimension to your experiment. So you have to repeat your experiment as many times as you have scheduled steps. Now here I've used a 10 step schedule, uh, which would mean that you would, if you had an MRSI acquisition, you would have to repeat it 10 times. We do have shorter schedules. We have a, a five step schedules. And as I've said, the amount of uh, the performance per unit time is uh, independent of the schedule length. So you could use a five-step schedule, but this again would mean that you would have to multiply your MRSI acquisition duration by a factor of five. And, and that again, depends on whether you have a, you know, how, how long your MRSI acquisition is, but usually that's a fairly heavy price to pay. Now, the added answer to that is that when you look at the initial uh, MRF paper, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this paper over here, what they've done is they use the fact that they had the variable excitation to create what's, what you could, I guess, think of as incoherence in K-space. Uh, and they use that to basically undersample in K-space and, and then filter out the aliasing artifacts. So they use this variable excitation to accelerate. Uh, now you could do this with an MRSI fingerprinting approach as well. How well this would work and how much acceleration you would get, I do not know. We have not uh, tried it yet. And uh, you know, we have, I think a lot of other things on our plate. I'd be very happy to work with anyone who wants to give this a spin and, and see if it works. I, I'm, I'm happy to share code and uh, sequences and then so on. Uh, so if anyone here is curious uh, or is looking for a postdoc, I'm happy to, happy to oblige. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, so when you presented your data on the control and MCI patients, you presented NAA and myoinositol. Um, mm -hmm. Were there any other metabolites you were interested in looking at um, and how would that, does that affect your acquisition in any way, shape or form, or can you really get all metabolite relaxation times and concentrations in one shot? Well, so I'll answer in reverse. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the answer to the last question is yes. Uh, basically we get everything that the conventional acquisition gives you plus the relaxation times. And the sort of rule of thumb that we've observed in our own work is that the CVs on the relaxation times of a metabolite would usually be similar to the CVs on the concentrations. So if you have mm. poor estimates of uh, glutathione uh, concentrations, you also get poor estimates of T1 and T2 of glutathione. Uh, now, we basically acquired everything and I'm only showing you the things that have changed uh, in a statistically significant manner or almost significant for the T2 relaxation times of uh, myonositol here. Mm. Uh, but we actually didn't see any of the other metabolites uh, change appreciably. Hmm, that's interesting. We, which, um, which again, which again, I, I think it's kind of a good uh, sanity check uh, for us. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
what you were yeah. saying? I was just wondering if you had seen anything in, in uh, total choline, because that was, we, we do MRS in a rat model of Alzheimer's disease. And that was actually mm -hmm. our strongest effect was total choline as opposed to NAA or myonositol. So, I mean, there's a, a wide variability of, uh, of results in the literature. So I don't know, I, 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 honestly, I think that there is such heterogeneity in, the, in both the models and the patients that I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have seen reports of uh, both creatine and choline uh, abnormalities mm -hmm. in, in AD. Yeah. Uh, but I have no, I mean, there, I, I really have no way of saying why in some studies people have reported this and in others they have not. Can you tell me what your model is? It's called the TGF344 AD rat. It's basically an APP PS1 rat model um, with a Fisher okay. background. So it's, it also spontaneously develops tau pathology um, mm -hmm. without any tau mutation. So it's one of the more, I guess, representative models um, because in humans tau, tau pathology develops spontaneously as well so it's it hasn't been assessed with MRS we will hopefully be the first assuming I can get the data published ASAP um, so it's it's pretty interesting so far we, we can, do can see you, quite a few changes out of curiosity uh, can, can you just say that uh, can you say uh, in addition to choline have you seen anything else yep uh, we've seen increased myonositol kind of as expected, but it, it wasn't our strongest effect. Um, mm -hmm. Increased lactate um, and then decreased taurine, very strongly decreased taurine, which was interesting. Um, NAA changed a little, but it, it didn't survive kind of FDR correction. So we're actually seeing kind of broader results like that have been reported across more of the AD literature than just NAA and myonositol. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's so far it's looking very interesting, um, and we have MRI data and behavioral data as well. So we're going to be packaging mm -hmm. that up shortly. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, um, I think we'll just give a I guess silent round of applause. <laughs> um, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. And. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks to Jamie for connecting us and Malar for setting this up. This has been great. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk.